Okay, so yes, uh, trending, and we're talking about the digital age. I feel very lucky uh, having heard multiple keynotes and a couple of the sessions, um, really giving you all this information so I don't need to sort of trot out again the ways that the digital world is providing stress. And uh, just reminded even of the little snippet of the, the gal who was using the internet basically to support her hypochondria. And, and that's a great example of how the digital age is dramatically increasing stress for all of us. So great, I don't need to convince you all of that and then allow me to do some other things instead. Um, yeah, consciousness, so what is it? Um, are you here? And it seems like a really funny question. Um, we could take this apart if we're philosophy majors. Are you here? Question mark. Um, this seems very solid, doesn't it? You know, if you hit here, you're thinking this is very solid. But I need to tell you, and it's probably not a surprise, even if it's a little counterintuitive. Um, yeah, I'm not adjusting my voice from this point. 99.9%, um, .9%, in fact, more than that, you know, every atom that you have is empty space. So th this isn't really actually solid. I mean, it seems like it because we have the same non-solidity. Um, so your mobile phone, your house, your car, your pets, your kids, your spouse, if you go on a romantic date, they're also empty space. 99.99%. Um, .99%. Moreover, if we go down past the level of the atom, okay, to the quantum level, and there's really two quantum levels, okay, the part that you usually hear about in the news, like quarks and stuff like that, and then you can go further, something called quantum chromodynamics. You don't need to know that word, but... 90% of that tiny amount of matter that's left over, that too disappears. And it's just energy. So really, almost everything is energy. And then that really asks the question, are we here and, and just what are we? I mean, I think we all have a sense, even though scientifically, you know, it can't be proven. Are you conscious, Jane? You know, scientists say you may not be. Yeah, there's no way to prove it. <laughs> okay, this is true potentially for any of us. Um, maybe we're just consciousness, whatever that is. Okay, energy that's self-aware, that has patterns, and so on. I don't know, it's an open-ended question. But it does sort of suggest that maybe there's, how many people in this room? Maybe 80? 75? So 75 blobs of consciousness floating in the, the ether. And then everything else, the matter that we think is here, is just sort of made up. So th this little statistic um, got me really thinking about what is consciousness. And... Um, then we're, of course, going to get into the psyche with Jung. What do you have to say about it? Well, first of all, we might wonder, like, do we, how do we experience consciousness? And I love in science, philosophers come along and they talk, especially here in England, you have some atheist philosophers who are really well known. And, you know, they make arguments like nobody is really conscious or, you know, consciousness, like it's a thing you can put in a box and sell it. But we experience it all the time. We wake up in the morning. You know what it's like when you're half asleep? You're sort of conscious and you're sort of not. What about when you're driving to work? How walking up here? Do you remember the route or was it sort of half conscious as you went? So we do a lot of half conscious stuff. Um, being under the influence of alcohol or drugs that can alter your experience of what's going on. Anyone done lucid dreaming? I think once, like 25 years ago. It's sort of, you know, you're, you're inside your dream and you know that you're inside your dream. Um, ooh, ooh, yes. Uh, Naomi Quank and the concept of being in the grip. So if somebody does something really wild, they get enraged, they do something very weird for them, and then they say afterwards, that wasn't me. That was like a different consciousness. Who, who was that? Um, enjoying flow. You sort of know what this is. If you're a musician and you really get into the flow, or maybe you're a dancer, um, maybe it's just a really great conversation, and the time passes, you don't even notice it. So your awareness is shifting. And the kinds of, the kinds of behaviors and the things you're attentive to, that, that your feelings, your thoughts, all of that can shift. Um, referring to one's own thoughts, feelings, etc. I'm, I'm sure most of you have pets. And if your pet sees himself in the mirror, do they know that that's them? Our dog figured it out. She used to jump on my parents' bed, and she would bark at her reflection. And we could hear her upstairs, because that was directly above the dining room. And then we heard her barking and bouncing, and then one day she just stopped. But she, we didn't hear the like of her coming down from the bed. So we went upstairs and sort of peeked into the room. And there she was, looking in the mirror. I'm really not kidding you. Like This is a poodle terrier. And she's just looking. She never barked at the mirror again. In fact, she's never jumped on the bed to look at the mirror, as far as we know. 
she figured out, oh my god, I'm a dog. <laughs> <laughs> there's also the sense of self, there's I, there's ego. Okay, ego means different things. I'm very sad when I went to Wikipedia, they give Freud's definition of ego. They don't mention Jung at all. You have to really, I think, go searching to find that. Don't worry, though, we're not mentioning Freud here. Um, empathy for others. Oh, I already did. Um, empathy for others, feeling of connection. So that's also a sense of an altered state of consciousness. We're feeling what's going on with somebody else. Even if it's just our mind doing it, we're having a different experience. Um, and then we say mind, and what does that mean? Is mind the brain, the psyche? Well, we said everything wasn't really matter. So maybe mind and psyche, they're all part of the same thing. Yeah? And then a meditative state. So you maybe have heard about monks in, in Tibet, and there's this few non-attachment. Compassionate non-attachment. I feel great empathy for you as I don't care. <laughs> um, I mean, it's slightly facetious, but it, it is a wonderful state. And the non-duality, the sense of there's no separateness between oneself and the universe. That all the boundaries sort of disappear. And this comes out of meditative practice and that kind of thing. So yeah, we have all of these shades of consciousness and kinds of consciousness. We're also filled with contradictions. You know, this is what keeps psychologists busy. In fact, all of you, well, most of you probably make your living off of these, right? These pieces of baggage. Um, filters, you know, when you see. We know we have perceptual filters. Um, let's see, projections, when we struggle with somebody. So, you know, oh, I don't like them in the news. I'm hearing about this, you know, those terrible people uh, on the other side of parliament. And then there's all of these, who are you interacting with exactly? Assumptions, when we exist, oh my god, I exist, we have assumptions, right? We grow up in a particular culture. We assume, for example, that we should be wearing shoes, that we should be wearing clothes, so that you know, we eat with utensils, we get all these cultural things. Feeling, feeling makes us vulnerable, and therefore there could be hurt, there could be fear, there could be guilt, shame, all of these things. Uh, love is also part of vulnerability, and then there's some defenses, maybe. When we speak, do people always speak honestly and plainly? No, we lie, we obfuscate, um, we get really into Jung, and then we have really long sentences that we can use, but does anybody really know what we're saying? Do we? You know, Jung was really good at that. So he described aspects of the psyche. He said, I mean, that's great, right? Nobody can quite understand what you're saying, so they keep studying it, but they know there's something there. That's like the perfect product, right? <laughs> Any of you in, in marketing, this is my, I'm terrible at marketing, but that's my idea. Um, so, you know, this, this is very, this is so disrespectful to Jung, but nonetheless, it's sort of because we're talking about consciousness. More consciousness, more unconscious. So there's a spectrum here. I could have said less conscious, but I really want to give the unconscious its due. You know, it was Jung who also did the initial experiments. What is around 1912 or 14, something like that, with word association tests that established within academic psychology that there are such things as unconscious processes. And there's also things that are more private to the self, or more public. So the persona is the mask that we wear when we're in public. All of you are wearing a mask right now. Hopefully that mask is the attentive, excited, enthusiastic student, right? But not too excited or attentive. I'm supposed to be the, what is it, the, the caring, passionate teacher. That's the mask that uh, I'm supposedly wearing. We'll see. Um, remember we said non-attachment earlier. Acceptable behavior is appearances for others. There's also the ego, I, me. Okay, and this was a little experiment. You can go through your day. One, years ago, I tried this. I couldn't even get through a day to practice introverted feeling. That before I ever said anything, I would stop and think, oh, how will the other person receive it? With the assumption I shouldn't say anything. What, what if the, you know, I hurt their feelings or something? Gosh, it must be really difficult to be an INFP or ISFP. Because potentially anything you say could be hurtful. Or construed the wrong way. Or, or you know, put you on the spot. Or suggest a commitment or identity that isn't actually true. That was very difficult. So I tried to, for one day also to substitute the word I with my ego. I didn't make it through the day either, but it was a nice sense of, you know, it felt heroic at the time to at least try it. And it's self-maintaining, that's the idea of the ego, is that there is the sense of self. Jung said that this may actually be the only thing that is definitively ours, and ours, each of us and ours alone. There's the shadow, the rejected parts of the self that can bring you distress, um, also, we project it onto others, positive or negative. Oh, that person is so amazing. Why do we think they're amazing? And we project it onto them some qualities that maybe we don't have in ourselves, or maybe we do, and we admire those in others as well. 
and then archetypes, these universal images, roles, themes rooted in biology, rooted in history. And this is a little cut off, but it's the idea, transcendent function. And it's right in the center here. It's this unifying element. Uh, Jung called it a unity function. Because, um, of course, you know, transcendent function, unity function, let's just use different terms to mean sort of the same thing. Um, the means to resolve conflicts between these things. So we have a sense of landscape. And then the question was, is how do we resolve the conflicts that we saw here? How do we work with this? This is a model. You can't just take this to a client and say, well, look at this amazing model. Don't you feel better now? <laughs> no. So his idea was the, the power of symbols, that there, we can use symbols as something we can continually engage in and make meaning of in order, they're essentially going to act in a therapeutic role, sort of like a mandala is an example of a universal symbol. It is not a universal symbol, but in a sense it is. Uh, I based it on a part of one of his talks uh, in 1932, this symbolic representation of the adolescent hero's journey. And what are the things that you see in it? You know, there's a lot of things going on. What are, what are some things that you see that, that stand out? What's the meaning of this? Um, I looked first at the top, so um, the different um, weather conditions and positive and negative changing, but overall positive, that this is challenges of life. Yes, yeah, yeah. So there, there's a positive attitude towards challenges. And notice that there's in the box here some strong, solid lines. But on the top and the bottom, they're dotted lines. Because when you look up at the sky, we think, well, you know, who's out there among the stars? What's out there? And the stars are also associated with the future and destiny and possibility. When we have a suggestion of the cycles, what are some other things? Jane, what do you see? I see the treasure boxes and the fish and the boat. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of stories. Jung sort of described that one of these boxes does contain a treasure, but we don't know which one. One of them contains trash. Okay, that's miserable. You go through all of this work, and you're going to, like, Use your spear and overcome this, this underwater beast, which is called the Makara. And, and maybe you pick the wrong box, and it's trash. And this one here is a trap. So you have like a one in three chance for a, a happy adventure in the end. But, you know, you have your spear here. And what is a spear? The spear, I mean, I'm interpreting this also. The spear is talent. So it could be your tight talent, for example, or musical talent, something like that. And it's a little boat. But hopefully the weather's going to stay nice. But there are some challenges, too. There's something else in this picture that's really important, it's very symbolic. Yes? Male, female? Yeah, absolutely, male, female. And there are these eyes that are looking. Do we know how teenagers feel? Do you remember that? The sort of self-consciousness? Oh, they're looking at me, and even worse, they're looking at my parents, and my parents are idiots. <laughs> and they're just reflecting on me. And so there are these eyes, and it's part of this adolescent journey of how we're perceived and, and how we interact with others. There's also gender here, and it's below the waves. So the question is, we're going to dive in and deal with that and discover that. And they sort of look like islands, but then we've discovered that they're actually people's faces. That there's a symbolic, meaningful element to the world and the interactions. It's not just like sex for sex sake. That there, there's potential for romance, there's a potential for seeing, seeing and being seen, for admiration, for envy, uh, all of those things that come with the eyes and the face. And there are other ways to interpret this, too. There was someone said, what about the seaweed? What is that doing there? I added that because he talked about Gilgamesh and how Gilgamesh went down. He ate the seaweed and allowed him to breathe underwater. And so why, why not represent this? So really, really interesting is the idea of symbol solutions. And so mandala is a symbol, too. Um, now, Jung talked about yoga. And the reason we're bringing this up is because he talked a lot about consciousness in his four talks that he gave in 1932. This is not a book he wrote. This is basically a, a summary translation of his four talks. Um, and the first talk, I was really ready to throw it across the room, the book. I mean, even for me, I'm like this. I have no idea what he's talking about. And, and I don't mean like terms like yoga or kundalini. I, I've heard those before. I know what a chakra is, or it's actually chakra. Um, is the, you know, the way he writes, I'm like, oh my god, like, where are you going with this? Speak plainly. Um, no, so he talks about Kundalini Yoga, which is the yoga of awareness. So there's different schools of yoga. And this is not Hatha Yoga. So if you go to the fitness center, and they're going to have you like... I'm not going to try that in these pants, okay? That could be uh, uh, embarrassing. Um, 
but you know, I can do it. I can be on one leg. And, yeah, yeah. And so that, that's what happened. And that's great. That's for fitness. It's good for discipline and focusing. Um, but the, the talks that he gave are more Kundalini, which is about exercises and breathing. So you're continuously doing something. And there's over 3,000 different exercises. So every time you go, if you're one of those people who get bored, it's great. You have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, Kundalini was brought to the United States and just the, in Europe, North America in general in 1969, but of course Jung did all of his stuff before that. So he had traveled to India. He spoke with yogis. There was a yogi that came to Austria. Um, it's really interesting. He gave us talks and he asked afterwards the yogi from India, like, well, what do you think of this? You know, the talks. And the yogi's like, I'm pretty sure that your audience had no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> and these were his like closest students. Listening, his 20 closest students, or something like that. Um, and of course, he was relying upon translations of the, the traditional texts, and it turns out that there are some mistranslations there. So that's what I had to, to work with. And, and he focused not upon the historical part or the artistic part, but what do you think? He focused on the psychology part, the consciousness part. And I just want to give one quote from him, which I've broken into a few parts. From, from, I think it's, I don't know which talk it is, the second, third, fourth one, not the first one. It says, we begin in the head. We identify with our eyes and our consciousness, quite detached and objective. He doesn't mean detached and objective like the thinking function. He means like we've had a perception and we haven't done any kind of judgment yet. We haven't responded to it. Just information has come in. We survey the world. He says that is ajna. And that's the, the chakra, the space, and the sort of energy body and in, in uh, yoga, it's this region here near the eyes. And we may also use our imagination to interpret what we see. So we can sort of see sensing and intuiting, the two perceiving functions already right in here. I, this the last part about imagination is not a quote, because he, like, you know, he goes on for a paragraph. I'm going to just summarize. As a practical matter, since, quote, we cannot linger forever in the pure sphere of observation, we must bring our thoughts into reality. So we voice them, and so trust them to the air. When we clothe our knowledge in words, we are in the region of Vishuddha, or the throat center. So instead of being here, now we're here. It means the energy in our body is here, at the throat. I mean, that's where my energy is now, too, in talking. is coming from this part of the body. And it's very acceptable in, in Western culture. You know, you can be here upward. Well, I say Western culture, you know, the Italians are like here upward. <laughs> but he talks about that, too. Different European nationalities. Well, he says the French pretend that they're from here upward or something like that. It was very cute. Um, he says, but as soon as we say something that's especially difficult or that causes us positive or negative feelings, we have a throbbing of the heart. And then the anahata center, so that's the heart center right here, where the thymus is, where uh, there's still a lot of nerves and, and a lot of the immune system here as well as the heart. We have a throbbing of the heart, and then it begins to be activated. So you've seen those in those Jane Austen films, right? <gasps> the throbbing of the heart and the breasts are throbbing and all this very exciting, right? Okay, who can do that? There's special occasions that happen. I don't see anyone throbbing here now, right? <laughs> no. Okay, so we're, we're all safely British and up here, or if not, we're American or, or well, you know, Northern European, right? Anyone from Southern Europe here? Oh, that's so sad. What are they? Oh, they're on vacation right now, right? Yeah. Um, he says, still another step further, when, for example, a dispute with someone starts up, when we have become irritable and angry and get beside ourselves, does that sound like a familiar phrase, beside ourselves? Okay, yeah, in the type community. Then we are in Manipura, so that's the, the solar plexus area here. That's when we start to take action. <gasps> you know, you've moved me, and in romance it would be like going and, you know, you, you kiss the paramour. Uh, if, if it's anger... You know, your heart is thumped up because a person has insulted you, and then, you know, you get sort of tight in here. Um, and I discovered in, in learning about this, by the way, your stomach is here. I always thought the stomach was down here. That's not true at all. Okay, the stomach is actually up here. And in Japanese, when they say angry, there's a phrase. There's no word for anger. It's when your stomach's standing up. So you stand up, you're going to do something. And that's when we're beside ourselves. Then this dispute is highly impact. If this dispute is highly impactful, it may even stick with us deep down in our gut in what is called zvadishtana. So it's this region here. This is where, for those of you who do somatic work or you're working with clients who have trauma or something, the things get locked into the body, and the person is unaware, more or less, of what's sort of stored in the body down here. 
sort of some interesting ideas. And we're going to get again into the science of it, and is that really the case, and so on. Um, the answer is yes. It's remarkable what your lowly gut can do. Uh, which actually brings us to body-mind practices. By the way, are there any questions? We're doing good on time. I think we are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yes. Oh, that's what that is. Thank you. It's a test. Very gentle, not attachment. There we go. I know people listening to this recording will hate me later. Um, body mind practices. Oh, a any other? Question, question. Yes. So when you go to one of your professors at university and you say chakras, and they say, is there any evidence for it? What do you say? To oh, we're going we're gonna to see that, yes. Repeat there there the is question. very much so. Repeat the question. Oh, right. So the question was, is if you go and talk to a professor at the university and ask, is there any validation for that? Like, do we have a nervous system that runs through the rest of the body, or is it only in the head? Then the answer, I mean, some of them might be idiots, so I'll be honest, especially if they're in philosophy or but. Um, but but it's uh, but the answer is yes physiologically and I'll talk about the vagal nerve system and, and so on yeah other questions okay great um, are we under attack you know th this is one of the themes that I've heard throughout the conference in the digital age is there are lots of benefits but also there's the sense that all the time we're inundated with stuff. You know, I get these pop-up messages all the time, and I try and turn some of them off. And I'm like, who is this horrible person who works for Apple or Microsoft or whatever who thought that constant pop-ups is something I want or need? What's going on with that? Urban noise. At least we have a countryside out here. I live in the center of Los Angeles. And it's really great. Like, 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning, you can hear the birds chirping. It's really cute. They come out and they chirp and they're happy, and then by noon they're hiding again because there's just this mass of helicopters and all. That's the problem of living near Hollywood helicopters. Um, then there's media. And I'm not even talking about social media or news media. To me, they're all the same. It's everything. Is there any media that's not manufactured with the purpose? No. I mean, it's all. And some of it may be fake. Well, if it's manufactured, it's always necessarily someone's interpretation. Maybe it's designed with fear. And it was a great little cartoon. Um, there's a couple sitting in their room watching, their living room watching TV, and the news is blaring, is there some way to stop fear in the world? And then one of them just puts the clicker and turns off the TV. Yes, there is. <laughs> okay, remove the sources of fear. Also, multitasking is one of the topics that has come up, that multitasking actually really degrades people's performance. Um, all of these create stress. No, a little bit of stress is good, but a lot of stress, and it's sustained all the time, it does things like constantly releasing hormones, stress hormones. So the fight or flight response is there a little bit all the time. What happens during the fight or flight response? Are you sort of carefree and using your imagination? Or are you really focused? You're really focused on running away. Although, mysteriously, if you're in one of those horror movies and you come to a door that requires a key, Okay, like this, and you can't, for the life of you, unlock that door this time. Because there's this element, it's not just constricted awareness, there's fear, it's affecting the whole body. Um, we also have seen wonderful studies, I mean wonderful in sort of a bad way, but nicely done, uh, with college students. So they, take, they allow them to come into a room and listen to a lecture, and they monitor them with, um, like, galvanic skin response. And they've taken away their cell phones. And within 10 to 15, I think the average was 12 minutes, there was a sizable number of students who began to show withdrawal symptoms from addiction. Where was my phone? Where was... In fact, even when we did our, our activity yesterday, exchange phones with somebody else, there were about 10 or 12 minutes. I, I think that's what it was. I would go down to my pocket, and then, oh, my pocket is empty. But there was that unconscious habit, or very, very slight conscious habit. So, and there's a dopamine hit that comes out of it. So in the spectrum of consciousness, how conscious are we when we get all of this noise? It narrows our awareness, we end up with automatic behaviors, just like driving to work, familiar road, you don't think about it. Now, in terms of the science of it, we know that the autonomic nervous system links the brain to all the rest of the body. They're all the rest of the body. 
So it's coming down here from the medulla, especially, but even the neocortex has connections. You know, they just discovered a direct line between the neocortex and the immune system hub here. And they're like, how did we go 300 years of anatomical studies and not notice this? But there it was. These are hormone-producing glands. So what do hormones do? Yeah, we can make sort of fun, and you know, hormones are for fun things, right? Uh, but they influence physical traits like height or hairiness, but they also influence aggression, appetite, mood, uh, how well you sleep, metabolic speed, many other things. Your gut, right here. You've probably heard of serotonin, right? Serotonin is this thing that when it's released, you feel, along with oxytocin is another one, you feel good and you want to connect with other people. And You know, 90% of serotonin is, is produced in your gut, not in your head, up here. And when does it get really produced is when you eat carbohydrates. Mmm, delicious carbohydrates. And then no wonder you feel good while you're eating and want to socialize with people. I suppose that's better if we were all grouchy while we were eating. That wouldn't be fun, right? That, that wouldn't be, humans wouldn't get along so well. So there's a major neurotransmitter that impacts mood and behavior. In fact, 80% of the signals in the nervous system are traveling up from parts of the body into the brain. Only 20% are going downwards to control the conscious things or maybe unconsciously, semi-consciously, some movements and so on. And that's not a bad thing to be unconscious. You know, I don't have to think about walking, thankfully. Now, what about these mind-body traditions? And I mentioned yoga because that's what Jung focused on, but we can look at other things. There are Western monastic traditions. I didn't know this in the Eastern Orthodox Church. There's a whole officially approved, carried on for seven, 700 years method that actually involves like some chakra energy centers in the body, three or four of them, and they do monastic kinds of things very similar to yoga. Never heard of it before. Jung had not either, by the way. So yoga didn't exist at all in the West. And he said that yoga was the highest of all human achievements. That's pretty, that's pretty high for, I mean, maybe he was speaking off the cuff, but um, there we go. They say that the raw energy that we have starts in the lower body and moves upward. But most people live maybe from here upward. I think especially if you're like a really like sensing, feeling type, you may be living from here. Your awareness is here. And by awareness, what I mean is it's not important unless it moves your heart to palpitate. This is very interesting with the Greeks. You know, they believe consciousness was in the heart. But they also had this attitude, and you see this among uh, uh, aboriginal tribes too, that unless it tightens your guts and makes you feel queasy, it's not a real thing or you feel butterflies or something like that. Unless you feel it in your body, it's not real. Here, we give all sorts of honor to things which aren't real, which you don't feel in our body at all. So that's what they mean by this. That the energy starts there and it moves upward, but so many adults are addicted to negative stories in their head. And they're only living up in here, that they become disconnected with their body. And he meant this for all people, not intuiting types or thinking types or something like that. So pretty strong claim to make. Seems sort of unbelievable, maybe. Well, let's return briefly to something we know well, because this is a type conference. Um, experiences are happening to us. How do we digest those experiences? Uh, I like the word metabolize the last few years from socionics. It's sort of a nice way of reminding us that things are happening and the functions are functioning. They help us function. We use them to function. Sensing, intuiting, thinking, feeling. Um, and that Jung described these four as mental functions. And that's the term that he used. So he, did, he used functions for other things, too. There's a transcendent function. There's a religious function. There are a variety of functions, but in the mind, mentally, there are these four functions. And then, of course, each of them can come and, you know, we have either a more introverted or extroverted attitude, and that generates eight types, and thus psychological types. Um, so we need to go over the functions. We all know those. And I use a picture in here with the squirrel getting the apple, and here's the tree with the roots. I'd like to talk about this, especially if you ever wonder, you're working with a client, and they're like, how come we don't just use five-factor model or DISC or something like that? Because something like DISC is just telling you what color your apple is. Oh, you have green apples, and here you have four red apples and, and two yellow apples. But if I actually want to raise apples, if I want to improve my orchard, I need to know the ecology. Like, what is the, why do trees produce apples? Anyway, okay, the seeds, and then there's a whole process. We need rain, we need sun. The, even the squirrel plays a role in this, other animals. So I think that's what type brings, and what Jung brings. So when he shows that picture of the adolescent hero's journey, that he's showing a process, and we can interpret that in the same here with the functions. We can 
show those and visually, and this provides a sense that this is something, part of a big picture. It's not just some word, oh, you're a sensing type or something like that. Um, I have to say uh, thank Steve Myers for doing the research because he's so good at, at indexing specific pages in books. I don't have patience for that. Um, one-sidedness in type. So what is this? And why am I talking about one-sidedness? Because I'm talking about how our attention gets focused. And consciousness, we have a certain consciousness. Okay, Jane's consciousness as an INFJ is different from mine for a lot of reasons besides us being slightly different types. So this is it's an actual thing, it's part of development. You know. In psychological types, these are all quotations, I try to establish the general lines along which one-sided developments move. When a function habitually predominates, like sensing or thinking, feeling, a typical attitude is produced according to the nature of the differentiated function. So that means as we use it, as we try it out, experiment with it, it differentiates, it gains character. There will be a typical thinking, a typical feeling, sensation, or intuitive attitude. And we know about that, it's type. When any of these attitudes is habitual, I speak of a psychological type. And so there's that habit aspect, like me going down from my phone, I automatically go to introverted intuitive. And if not, I'm going to go to my other pocket, which is extroverted thinking. Oh, is my keys here? Is my phone here? And I like it because the phone is very information oriented and the keys are very practical in terms of what they do. Um, these types represent different kinds of one-sidedness. Attitude is a readiness of the psyche to act or react in a certain way. So what does it mean? So it's, it's only half conscious. So we tend to be told, oh, you know, your, your, your preferred functions are your most conscious functions. But if they were the most conscious, God would be trying to figure out, like, hmm, how should I do introverted intuitive? I don't need to do that. And it happens almost automatically. This automatic phenomenon is an essential cause of one-sidedness. A conscious capacity for one-sidedness is a sign of the highest culture. So it means that if I come in and decide, you know, I know about type, and intuiting in this situation is not appropriate, and I'm going to try my best either to do some sensing or give the floor to somebody who can do sensing well, that's a conscious choice. He said that kind of one-sidedness is fantastic. We're conscious about our preference, and that thus one of you know the roles of the type community. Um, but involuntary one-sidedness, the inability to be anything but one-sided, to just use intuiting or even a non-preferred function in a way that we didn't, we're not aware of it, we're not choosing that. So it is a sign of barbarism. This is a great you as type practitioners are bringing civilization. Very British, isn't it? Yeah. And we didn't stop here. So the dangers of one-sidedness, both to oneself and society. And of course, when, when was he thinking about this stuff? So this was 1932 and, and afterward. And some of it was before also, because in the, the psychological types too. So he's even talking in the early 20s. What happened? Did something happen in the late you know, teens or early 20s? What would he be reflecting on? World War I. And already in the 30s, early 30s, they were aware that maybe a war was coming. Again, so if I had to name the most essential thing in analytical psychology, which is what uh, Jung's, or who was it, Jung or his followers who coined that term, but can we add to our, and then I need some help from Catherine. Weltanschauung. <laughs> Weltanschauung. Yes. Okay, I can with an ung on the end. Ung, okay. <laughs> it's terrible German, I know. And I'm not ashamed of that either. I should say it is the highest recognition, it is the recognition that there exists certain unconscious contents which the conscious mind must come to terms whether it will or no. So he says it must do it, but whether it will or not, so maybe it won't. So it means must, like there's a push to do it, but ultimately it may not happen, or happen well. Conscious and unconscious do not make a whole when one of them is suppressed and injured by the other. So now we're getting into the territory of type development. Both are aspects of life. This roughly is what I mean by the individuation process, a process of, or course of development arising out of the conflict between, in our case when we talk about type opposing preferences, but he meant really anything in the psyche. All those different little bags we saw at the beginning, there are different sides to them. To be strong and safe or to be vulnerable. Um, to speak the truth and maybe get into trouble, or to speak a lie, or to cloak our words in order to stay safe. Those kinds of things. It is impossible to convince anybody that the conflict is in the psyche of every individual, since he is now quite sure where his enemy is. Therefore, the conflict takes place on the plane of projection 
in the form of political tension. And he specifically meant politics. Like politics is the domain of projection where people take their personal psychological issues. So he turns around the mantra that's so common in the West, so everything is political, and he says, no, everything is psychological and everything is about consciousness and unconsciousness, the polarities that are there. It is the nature of political bodies always to see the evil in the opposite group just as the individual has an eradicate, er, eradicable tendency to get rid of everything he does not know and does not want to know about himself by foisting it off onto someone else. If you really take this seriously every day, boy, that's tough to think that every interaction, oh, I'm talking to this person, what am I projecting onto them? How can I withdraw this projection? Well, we have a sense already. He's given us a map in those quotes. If you feel it in your heart or in your solar plexus or in your gut, that's a sign that there is probably some projection going on. It's there in the body. Your body is telling you all the time. Just we're taught to ignore that. Oh, this person when I'm around them makes me queasy, but I'll just put that aside because we have to work together. Have you ever done that? That sort of vague sense of queasiness or not really discomfortable with this person. Okay, your body is more than just discomfort, but the mind is sort of like safely packaging it and saying this, maybe this is what's going on. So the transcendent function, we're going back to the thing that unifies ego, shadow, uh, elements, archetypal elements, persona elements, that the secret of alchemy was in the fact that the transcendent function, the formation of personality through the blending and fusion of conscious with the unconscious. Okay, this sounds great, but gosh, this is so abstract. Like, how we're, this is very broad. Yeah, we're going to do alchemy. Anyone know how to do alchemy? Yeah, maybe if you've done, like, depth psychology course, there's a proposed active imagination. Um, yoga, oh, yes, that's why we're talking about yoga. Yoga is a method of bringing together the conscious with the unconscious by blending mind and body elements. The transcendent function is the concept and practice of a dialogue between conscious and the unconscious through which the psyche transforms itself. And he's just saying, he goes on to say, like, this is why it appears, this is commentary about him, why it appears in all of his writing for the rest of his life. He also says the transcendent function facilitates transition from one attitude to another, whatever your attitude is, sensing attitude. He doesn't just mean extroversion, introversion, it's any attitude. And, and I love, he has a whole description, which I talk about in Jung on Yoga. I go through his, his descriptions and try and take like those 20 pages and move them down to one page. Um, no, it's three pages. Um, what, what is the process like? When there is full parity of opposites, in other words, there's something that's come up in the psyche that's just so, it's like you're sitting at your desk and you just can't do the work that you're supposed to be doing. Okay, like I would know for myself. So I've set myself up for a project and extroverted thinking says I have this amount of time to do the project, I can do this. And something in me is saying, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to call a friend. <laughs> Or you might think, I'm going to go have a smoke. I'm going to play a video game. Uh, it came up actually porn. You know, I was glad this porn was mentioned. 90% of internet traffic is porn. Okay, that's what modern technology has brought us, pornography. Okay, that, that's the main product. Um, what do you think is important then? But it's been, you know, sublimated. It starts when there's full parity of opposites, which means that impulse becomes like, you're just fearing much intention. And this necessarily leads to the suspension of the will. So you're saying we have this feeling that we can't act, we feel frozen in that moment when they're, when they're feeling equal. And since the, he says, since the, the I'm supposed to say will? Yeah, no, I don't know why it says lift. Uh, tolerate a standstill, a damming up of vital energy results. So as we're doing nothing, the vital energy is building up. The person is about to have some kind of eruption. You've been in a situation where you really want to say something, and you go along for half an hour, an hour, this and that, and you just really have to say something. Yeah? Um, I think I saw a moment like that between Susan and Ashton with the faculty, or the, the staff here. And it was great. And where is Susan? Yeah, you preempted that so nicely. It's like, yeah, don't roll your eyes about that. Yeah. And you weren't even looking at her at that moment. You knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But there, there's this like, there's something that's going to happen and it's going to come out. And this can't last unless the tension of opposites produces a new unity function that transcends them. And so I described this in more detail in Jung on Yoga, but I want to give you some fun here and sort of a visual. Oh, thank goodness, no more words. At least we have some visuals now. Your dominant function, okay, with this heroic ego quality. That doesn't mean they're the same. I mean, your ego and your dominant function are not the same thing. But there's this 
um, the idea that the ego is carrying a lot of the cool stuff about the dominant function. And then your inferior function with anima or animus. With, it. again, the inferior function is not the same as the anima or animus. So if you're not familiar with these terms, the anima for men is that, that inner feminine principle that's largely unconscious. And then the animus is the inner masculine principle for women. And then there's some, this area here of overlap between yellow and blue, and you bring them together, it creates green, the color of life. And this, by the way, this is great, this yellow, the color of the sun, of victory, of happiness. Here with the dominant function, and the blue, often the inferior function, it's the area of depth. What's under the water? Um, maybe a little sad, whatever it is. And then he offered uh, you know, a variety of techniques to elicit it, making mainly active imagination in order to get us the, these two circles to like come together a little bit better. So I'd like you to think about, for just a moment, what are some ways that you in your life have brought together your dominant and inferior function? And I'm going to give one example, and then I will pull from the audience to give some examples. One thing I found with me as being dominant, introverted, intuiting, is this idea of having a realization, of learning and just like, oh my goodness, this is completely different than I thought. It's like going to another level of awareness about an issue. And what I loved as a teacher is I didn't stand up like I am. I mean, I did some of it, you know, stand up in front and write some things on the board and talk. I would take them outside, and they would do live group simulation, and I would stand back and maybe give them a few cards to sort of screw with them a little bit. And, and they would go through the simulation for an hour, and then we would, they would come out of it, and we would debrief it, and they would say all of these things, these insights. I didn't realize their fellow students were not really egalitarian. That if they knew there was even the smallest amount of extra credit at stake, or believed that. Or in fact, they just wanted to have fun. Then they're willing to lie, cheat, and steal. Absolutely. They would steal each other's book bags um, to different groups. Like They would get together in groups and lie to each other. I mean, it was just amazing. One group even assigned a person to be like the, the media liaison. So they told him yes, and they formed a circle that was facing inwards, except for him. And he said, but, but how am I supposed to know like, what to tell the media? And they said, no, that's the whole point. Just make up something. <laughs> and I felt that by giving them an experience, that through the experience of them, they could have an insight on their own, a realization, as opposed to being you know, for force-fed something. And then in my own life, go and have experiences. And in fact, the more risky or a little bit dangerous the experience is, usually the more I get out of it. Because extroverted sensing is ultimately about actual risks at some point. So I'm going to just take a minute to think about one way even you have brought your dominant and inferior functions into your lives together. A better approach to dissect and analyze. So do, do, maybe she's really an introverted thinking type, right? No. Okay, that's bringing those things together. What about Isabel Myers? So she had an introverted feeling, dominant introverted feeling. But she had this passion, this quest to bring peace into the world and for people to have happier jobs and so on, better fits um, by understanding themselves through type. And sort of along the way, she ended up building a worldwide organization where people were attracted to the idea too. It's not like she did it all herself. But there is that extroverted thinking that came in and created this infrastructure. And in fact, isn't the MBTI instrument like this very extroverted thinking? It produces scores, and there's reports, and it's very objective. And so there's a beautiful intersection uh, for, for Isabel Myers between dominant function and inferior in the MBTI. Any other thoughts? Somebody wants to add an example? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and it's a beautiful example because it's all, one, it's something that you came up in your life. Like your parents getting older and having health issues is sort of out of your control. And it's sort of something that happens in our lives. It's a testing point or something like that. And it's also not like, you know, some huge legacy to the world. In a sense, you're doing 
the extroverted feeling thing, which is that, especially with introverted sensing at the same time, there's a sense of here and now with these two people, this is who I am helping. Yeah. Catherine? And just to add to that specific example, you are also trying to connect these caregivers to the individual people who are your parents. So you're using that connection to help them differentiate your parents from all the other patients that they're seeing. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, so um, I have extra intuition as my dominant function. So I love going out in the world and creating new ideas and making things happen. Uh, but it turns out that, uh, uh, as most people do, I have my own, interval, uh, my own health challenges over time. I developed uh, type 1 diabetes when I was age 8. And it turns out that that means you've got to do a lot of self-monitoring, very careful self-monitoring. So if I'm not careful, then I'm getting to do nothing with my extroverted intuition because I'm not at my best health, I'm not at my best um, monitoring sleep. So I figured out that I spend a lot more time, I think, being aware because of my own life and my own challenges and what I want to go do. I spend a lot more time embracing my introverted sensing so that I can monitor and maintain my own health. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, and, and again, that's, um, you know, those are things that we incorporate into every day that are not like some huge, you know, like on stage, you know, the news is going to come and interview you about it. It's part of your own development process. Now, do you, oh, yes, we'll take one more and then the question. Yeah. Making, making spreadsheets look human and accessible and friendly to touch. And your type preferences are? ENFJ. So ENFJ. dominant extrovert dealing with uh, inferior introverted thinking. Mm -hmm. And now, how many people do you think out there in the world, or let's just say in, in, um, in the UK, have a chance in their careers or personal lives to actually do some of these transcendent function opportunities? So, for example, Linda presented some stuff around this to the Bay Area APT a couple of years ago, and there were a lot of INTJs in the audience. Surprise, okay? Um, no, and, and it was really interesting because she described some things that were very typical when these come together. And about half the INTJs were like, oh yeah, like I totally do these kinds of things. And the other half were like, what? No, like I, what are you talking about? I think I must be an INTP. Literally one was like, I think I'm an INTP then. And, and yet she's like, no, but I'm an INTJ. So maybe the model was wrong. And, and I think actually what happened in this, I feel so lucky. What if I were a teacher or professor where I had a prescribed list of things I must cover in a certain way. I didn't have the freedom to teach in a way where I could take the students outside. Then I wouldn't be able to do that. Okay, what if I had uh, five children and four elderly, sickly parents, and you know they got divorced and remarried, so four parents, and would I be able to even be here now? Okay, so I do think that life at times presents some people more than others with opportunities to bring these two together. So that some of your role also as counselors or coaches or whatnot is to help people see the opportunities in their lives, even with all the constraints that they may have. And sometimes the constraints actually are the, the origin of where that's going to come in for that synergy. Yeah. Now, I'm going to end with a few things about the value of this. As you know, I, I use a brain imaging technology to take a peek into people's brains. <laughs> uh, it's always fun. Uh, they wear this little cap or they wear a band and they maybe do 30 minutes or an hour worth of activities. In the last couple of years it's been great. I've been able to look at teams and organizations and executives. Sometimes there's very high cognitive diversity in a team, sometimes very low diversity in a team, and that may suit the organization's needs as well. It's not necessarily bad, but just saying that. But they try all of these different activities. They do gaming and drawing and communicating. Uh, imagining, you know, when I see this interface or something similar, I have a different machine now, but it's still sort of that idea. And so I decided, what about me? Okay, Should, I, I'm going to wear the cap, and I have interns, um, so they, they can run the stuff for me. And I have a baseline, I know what my brain looks like when I'm doing like everyday things. And I said, let me meditate for half an hour. Because I've been doing uh, Kundalini yoga for over a year, I mean, in a concerted effort, and for a variety of things, like three and a half, four years, um, leading up to that. And I said, Let, let's find out what's going on in the brain. So the brain network shift. And the, the activities I were doing were things that would stimulate the VNS, which is the vagal nerve system. 
So that's the, the, kind of the part of the nervous system that relaxes us um, for eating and sleeping and um, good stuff, you know, hopefully that will come with meditation. Um, mostly I'm just doing not the meditation, but like breathing exercises with the meditation. Uh, and it's really interesting because for most people, the first 10 minutes of like concerted breathing exercise is really unpleasant. Because the ego's like, no, I don't like this. No, you can't keep breathing this way. Well, yes, you can. Because the, the only reason that little voice is scared, and so many people report that the first few times and even afterwards, is because they know that what carries the ego in the brain, it's called the default network, is going to get turned off. So one of the main sort of modes or defenses that carries along that ego structure gets turned off in meditation, typically after about 10 minutes of, of meditation, you know, that's in a trained way, breathing, uh, there's a variety of techniques that can be done. So this is my default, okay? Um, I say Joe, but I just mean that in a general way. Whole brain flow, we see the starburst pattern, very typical of, of dominant intuiting types. I'd like the strong executive function right up in here between these two prefrontal areas, my two CEOs cooperating well together, um, which in practice means that my perceiving and judging functions are like happily in sync. Um, goal focus with uh, many individual skills that I have. And I say that because there are all these little gray lines that come out. And these are goal focus CEO connecting to these different things. Very typical for IJ types. I can do this really well as long as you don't interrupt me. And then I can do this other completely different thing. Okay, so this is computer programming and this is scheme, but as long as you don't interrupt me, so I'm not multitasking, you can focus. Um, then there's some back of the brain stuff that's sort of neat. Uh, it's typical of introverts, some things going on back here. Then I did the 30 minutes of meditation. And after about 10 minutes, I get into it, and then we look at overall. Well, there's still this whole brain flow that's going on there. Very nice. And um, this executive regions here are very weak now, because that's the whole point of these techniques, is they sort of break up the ego-like executive functions. Um, however, I'm a little bit more open-ended than anything. I've got a little bit of connectivity to that open-ended side of the CEO, because you've got goal-focused CEO and open-ended CEO. Um, strong links over here on this is sort of the right brain. Okay, what is this about? Regions that are implicated in values, uh, religious identity, beliefs, uh, attending to voice tone and intention, sort of this abstract reasoning stuff, a little bit, but strong connections right in this area here on the right brain, not left side. 